But your directions, once we got there, was, were terrific. Oh, good. Because uh, I would have sent them to you, but it didn't occur to me until it was oh, too no. long. Okay. 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 Jackson Quest, and I don't know if he told you about the Robert Jackson Center. Which yes, he was kind there. enough to send me a newsletter. Do you issue those periodically? You saw the first one. We're, we're really a work in progress. We're only a year and three months sure. old, but things well, have happened very well. You'd be very... kind enough to put me on your mailing list. Oh, I'd, I'd be, be honored. Most grateful. I would be absolutely honored. Uh, I find that longevity has its merits as our <laughs> thin red line of prosecutors gets thinner. That's... Do you keep in touch with anybody? Uh, a number of people, mm -hmm. uh, particularly Drex Sprecher, right. and very much with Henry King. Right. He and I were close friends. I was saying to your husband while uh, you were chauffeuring <laughs> that uh, I uh, had not seen my fellow prosecutors for almost 50 years because after Nuremberg, I went one way and we all went different ways. And several times when there were reunions, uh, I unfortunately was unable to attend. The last one in 1996, I think I was abroad at the time, yeah. probably in Bermuda. We spent uh, a lot of time there. and. Uh, But in recent, uh, last couple of years, ever since 98 particularly, I was invited to a, uh, oh, I had spoken on Nuremberg over the years okay. to groups and audiences. But uh, I was out of the mainstream. Uh, I was very active in, I was with AT&T in the last 30 years before I retired. And uh, my duties there were principally, well, first of all, I thought I had left criminal law completely behind. <laughs> See, when I went with AT&T, in fact, I started with Bell Laboratories for four years in their legal department. Oh, okay. And uh, I didn't even realize until I was being interviewed that it was Bell Telephone Laboratories. And, uh, is a long story which I won't encumber you with, but I was being sort of babysat by the director of personnel mm -hmm. while the general counsel was at a meeting of the board of directors, and uh, so he was boasting to me how famous Bell Laboratories was, and I kept saying yes, and he'd say, yeah, I have you had any experience with radios? And I had been in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. So I said, yes, I knew that, you know, we had a couple of radios and he turned one on. If it didn't work, he turned on another. <laughs> that was my knowledge. So we kept talking across purposes and finally he said, and he kept telling me what a wonderful institution and they were just building Murray Hill mm. at the time. The headquarters were at 463 West Street, which is 12th Street in New York, right at the river. They had a a building that was as large as the block occupied by Macy's in New York, but 26 stories high. Wow. Then finally he said something about Bell Telephone Laboratories, and I looked at him and I said, Telephone Laboratories? He said, yes. And then in his, uh, I guess instinctively, without thinking and probably discourteously, I said, oh, never heard of you. Oh my God. I had thought I was in Bell Laboratories, Bell Aircraft. Oh. And, uh, but after that glitch, uh, <laughs> things went well. It was very funny, they, in those days. Now this was during your interview for the job? Is that what you were there for, or? Yes, okay. and I was there reluctantly. The minister of our church had been we lived in Riverdale, New York at mm -hmm. that time, and I was with the Attorney General's office. And uh, he uh, was looking about for me, 
since we had a lot of very prominent attorneys of Riverdale who was a much nicer accommodation than we did at the time. And I had been looking for about six months and I finally had narrowed down to three companies and for the first time I got offers. I've been going to all sorts of interviews with GE up in Schenectady. Mm -hmm. I had had six or interviews, they had a winnowing process. They started with a hundred likely candidates and then fifty and then you sort of worked your way up the ladder of prominent lawyers who looked you over and burped. And uh, so finally they made me an offer and I had to tell them on that Friday. And I had been very interested in a small firm about your size Mm -hmm. in Dayton, Ohio. Mm -hmm. Just charming fellows, and it sounded like a great practice. And they made me an offer for that Friday. And then thirdly, there was a very prominent firm of lawyers involved in Hollywood and entertainment on Madison Avenue in New York. And all three made me an offer, but I had to, and this is after six months of nothing but Mm -hmm. interviews, which they'd say, well, you great qualification. Uh, we'll keep you in mind, you know, that right, story. Sure. And so that Thursday night, Father Barry called and said uh, he'd heard there was an opening at Bell Laboratories and he had talked to some of the people involved and, and they had talked to the general counsel and he had asked to be relayed to me that he would like to see me. So I said, well, gee, I, I really can't. You know, because this is Thursday. This is about four o'clock. And I said, I can't afford not to take one of those three offers. I would never get another offer. <laughs> <laughs> and I really felt that way at that time, you see. So uh, Father Barry said, well, why don't you just call him? And I called this gentleman, his name was Bill Toole. He was vice president, general counsel, and secretary of the company. And he was charming. He later became a second father to me because my father died shortly after I went with the firm. Mm -hmm. And so he said, why don't you come down at least? Because we have the board of directors meeting on Friday. And you have to be approved by the board. This is for four men, there were only four men in the legal department who were general attorneys. The others were patent attorneys. Mm-hmm. They had a hundred of those. They had nothing to do with the legal at that time. And they had not hired anyone since 1925. Right. This yeah. is 1953. Wow. So uh, he said, we're quite interested in you because we have a real problem in Germany with some very valuable cable. He said, why don't you take a cab down in the morning? So I figured, well, you know, as a matter of courtesy, I'm sure that he's not going to listen to me and hire me then. At least that hadn't been my experience with all these others. So we went down and we hit it off very well. And believe it or not, he came in and we talked for an hour. And he said he made me an offer and it was $500 more than GE. $9,500. $9,500. Those days, $500 could do a great deal. And uh, <laughs> and I was very interested they, in, in some of the problems he said we'd be working on. So uh, sure enough, he went to the board of directors and they approved me. Great. Then I had to go downtown to be passed on by the senior counsel of AT&T, which at that time owned Bell Labs complete 100%. And uh, quite a difference the way they treated lawyers in those days. And I'd had about 10 years of, well, let's see, well, 12 years since law school at that time. And they hired no one that had less than 10 years. Mm -hmm. That was the vogue. Where'd you graduate from? Harvard. Have you went from Harvard? Now, where are you from originally? Where were you born? I was born in New York. Um, I lived a great many places, sort of all over. I went to um, 
New York University. At, uh, at that time, they had a branch at a place called University Heights, which was outside of the mainstream of the city. And uh, then I went to Harvard Law School and graduated in 1941. And later, coincidentally, when I was at Bell Labs, since they wanted lawyers to have a little more luster, since there were so many PhDs at Bell Labs, okay. I took a LLM in labor law at um, New York University downtown. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> I was with Bell Labs for four years and then went over to AT&T as sort of general labor counsel for long lines and long lines at that time did the bargaining for the Bell system, which had a million employees, so it was a lot of fun. Right, Dolly. You destined, were you destined to be a lawyer? Were you destined, was that something you No, wanted? I wasn't. I had a, an uncle who was a very famous, in his time, uh, surgeon and brother of my mother, and he was a celebrated doctor. So I thought I, and I sort of was designated that I would be a doctor, and I found very quickly when I went to college, <laughs> the first uh, three months, I broke the record for breakage for a year in the laboratory, finally winding up by putting one of these long thermometers that you opened, uh, they had a wooden casing, you opened it, extracted the thermometer, and somehow I got it through my Oh. And uh, in chemistry, I couldn't remember a blessed one of those symbols. So I, uh, I guess it was around Thanksgiving, the dean of students sat down with me and he said, we've got a problem. I said, I'm beginning to recognize it. He said, you have three A's and one D minus and one F so far. <laughs> he said, I don't think you're skewed towards medicine. And I said, I couldn't agree with you more. So they were very gracious about it. They, if I dropped the two courses, they would not appear on my record. If I did it before Thanksgiving, that was the standard procedure. And then I went to uh, summer school and took two courses mm -hmm. to make it up, but I never looked back. Now when I, and I've never had much interest in medicine. Interestingly, my brother who went into business really should have been a doctor. Right. He has great interest and he's almost uh, obsessive sometimes about it, but he's very good. Then 1941 you graduate, were you, were you, did you register to the, in the service? Uh, uh, 1941 when I graduated, I'd been in the Air Force Reserve to some degree, and I had known that war was coming right. very vividly because uh, every year from 1935 to 1939, I spent four months abroad in Europe. Mm -hmm. And I spoke quite good German, French, a little Dutch, a little Norwegian and some English. And uh, What took you to Europe? My father believed it was just great to travel mm -hmm. and uh, that traveling for a young man uh, was as educational or more so than formal education alone. Right. So I loved it and uh, I, my family uh, had been long separated at that time. There was an early divorce in the family. Right. And, uh, and I was in Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia, long before World War II. And in fact, I was in Scotland on Sept in September of 1939. I was walking with John of Grotesland on a hiking trip, hiking trip came out in Inverness to learn that the country's 
the world was at war. And uh, of course, I was very excited about that. I, it was no surprise to me because I had seen it coming for, I had seen Austria under the Nazis and seen Germany under the Nazis and had no illusions that they were going to uh, keep going as far as they could. Right. And uh, in fact, I spent two glorious weeks in Scotland uh, waiting for a ship because all of the British ships, the Cunard Line and others, had been immediately taken over by the British government on mm -hmm. September 1. And we had to wait while small American ships came over to pick up the hordes of Americans. Of course, being, uh, let's see, 1939, I guess it was just about 20. Just, just 20. Mm -hmm. I was having a great time. Sure. Only upsetting thing, my father would keep calling every few days, and that time it was $12 for three minutes, which was an exorbitant sum. Oh, yes. and, uh, he so, he, had, oh, okay. and so as you were watching and, and traveling through Europe for all this time, and you saw, of course, the Nazis had, had uh, in Czechoslovakia, in fact, uh, they had sort of a passively taken that over, Czechoslovakia. Uh, did, did you ever realize that many years later, maybe 10 years later, you'd be prosecuting a case which, oops, excuse me, involved that same thing? No. Uh, <laughs> of course, at those days, I was more interested in knowing whether I'd survive. Uh, but I was quite fascinated. Uh, I came back to Harvard, and of course, we would receive uh, all the broadcasts from Canada. Right. And the in June of 1940 was the Battle of Britain. Sounds like my wife. Hi there. Greetings. We were working our way towards uh, you were in Europe and oh, yes. reflections on uh, the state of Europe in the in the late 30s. Yes, I was uh, quite keen on uh, getting into the war and uh, and I was pretty well certain that war would be coming shortly that would involve the United States since mm -hmm. World War II was then raging when I was in law school and uh, so when I graduated I had a, a number of the usual offers starting level and uh, one was from the British Ministry of Supply Mission so I was uh, very delighted to take that because I anticipated I'd only be there about six months mm -hmm. uh, since I went in about oh, September of 41 I had graduated in uh, June of 41 and as a result, uh, I did a lot of work in the legal department, uh, a lot of litigation in the area of Lend-Lease at that time. They were very involved in the Lend-Lease mission. Uh, the United now tell States, me how that, explain how that worked. I've heard the term. Well, a deal was set up between after the losses sustained by Great Britain mm -hmm. on the Atlantic was so heavy, submarine losses, they desperately needed additional ships. So we gave them literally 50 overage destroyers to serve as escorts for the convoys. And uh, the uh, I'm just getting train of thought is broken for a moment. The um, quid pro quo were various bases that were given, and in addition, uh, for example, Bermuda was one of the 
space is given to us that we could establish a naval base at. Right, right. And there were a number of others that were uh, quite important. And Roosevelt was very keen on supporting the British, but there was a very strong anti-war movement, particularly again from the extreme right, right. conservatives like Rankin. And um, so after much negotiation between Churchill and uh, Rosa, we made this deal. In addition, we loaned them after the British had literally used up all their assets in the United States, uh, a number of billions of dollars to purchase our products. And that was on a uh, on a payback basis, and the actual leasing of the basis was part of that uh, mm -hmm. deal. I think we had a 99-year lease. We recently gave up our lease uh, on on Bermuda, for example. Closed the base a couple of years ago. Interestingly enough, since I'm involved in the Robert Jackson Center, Robert Jackson was the Attorney General at the time which rationalized or wrote the opinion which Franklin Roosevelt relied so that he felt like he didn't have to go to Congress in order to cut the deal. Yes, and it was very interesting. I, I just realized now when you say that how what comes around, what goes around, comes around. Well, so uh, later, one of my vital uh, important duties at AT and T was to handle all relations involving electronic surveillance with the Department of Justice and other law enforcement agencies. And I also testified very extensively before Congress on that. And one of the key questions was whether we thought that the Attorney General acting in the name of the President could engage in wiretapping without court order under the general powers of the President mm -hmm. uh, as Commander-in-Chief and in charge of foreign policies. And the uh, 1968 Act Creating the Federal Wiretap Law had a provision that was ambiguous. In, in essence, uh, they ducked the issue and said, the President can act to the degree that he's constitutionally permitted. And uh, so we were quite involved, and I personally, in um, handling that situation which goes in one of the uh, first building blocks in our rationale was the agreement between Attorney General Jackson and Franklin Delano Roosevelt in which Roosevelt about 1940 or 41 authorized the Attorney General to engage in wiretapping for intelligence gathering purposes. <laughs> And I, I just realized that now, when you talked, I mean, it just brought it to mind. All of a sudden, you remember things. <laughs> That's terrific. Now, how did you find yourself, I guess, basically, how did you find yourself in Nuremberg? Kind of give me the steps, the stepping stones to find yourself at Nuremberg, Germany. Well, when I graduated and was commissioned in the Air Force, I went into the Air Force, and uh, I thought I was going in much earlier. Because after Pearl Harbor, I anticipated being called up very shortly. And in fact, I had told my employers in the British Ministry of Supply mission when they hired me that I didn't know how long I would stay. But since they were at war, this was a very understandable uh, position to be in. But it turned out I was there for, I wasn't called up until February of. Uh, I guess January or February of 1943, which was an incredible time, but they, for some reason they weren't calling up reserves, they were calling up draftees, but the Army never, 
and the Air Force never made any sense to me. So when I was commissioned, you had a choice of four or five different locations that you could request. And if there were any openings, they would uh, uh, assign you to that um, particular opening. So of course I asked for five European openings. And uh, I was a cadet captain, which was a better than average position, but it was probably third highest in the, that little class. So I was one of five out of a class of, I guess, about 60 that went to the Far East. Never did figure that out. Except that the Army and the Air Force always, well, it was actually at that time, it was the Army Air Force, uh, seemed to send you to a place that you certainly had no experience and to ignore any experience you had. And of course, I had so much European experience and spoke several languages and so forth. So during my time in the Air Force, I had as an extra duty a lot of Judge Advocate General work, prosecuted, which I had loved because it got me all over, particularly India and uh, it was really lush being able to travel to a city because we were stationed mostly up in Assam in north eastern uh, butt of India mm -hmm. uh, near the hump and um, so then I would after Japan surrendered we took a plane back to uh, Hamilton Field in California and then I was reassigned to the ferry command at Wilmington, Delaware. But we got 30 days leave because they really didn't know what to do with us. They had this huge end of the war pouring in of troops. And uh, in fact, I was at, when I landed in San Francisco, and of course, this was the first civilization really I had seen. We were stranded for two weeks in San Francisco. So I and one of the uh, fellow members of the crew uh, took, tried to get a suite at the Mark Hopkins Hotel. And, and that was my first time in San Francisco. And we finally got the only available suite. We got a bridal suite. Mm -hmm. And we spent two weeks there before coming across. Well, I had when I got to Wilmington, I was immediately said, go home for 30 days, rest and recreation, R&R, &R, which was standard for all returning troops at that time. In fact, they didn't know what to do with all the men they had on hand. And while I, I went home to Florida, and uh, I had been home very short time, and I received a call from Brigadier, then Colonel Telford Taylor, who was in Washington, D.C., and he had been sent over by Jackson after having been appointed the successor of General Counsel to recruit. Mm -hmm. And there had been some criticism, I understand all this is just hearsay, that at the first trial there hadn't been enough young lawyers who had been in the war serving at Nuremberg. So he was came back to recruit and among others he was interested in getting younger lawyers. And he uh, so he asked me to come down for an interview and I came down the next day and he laid it out and we managed to hit it off, so he made an offer. He said he'd like to have me assigned, and he asked me what I thought of it, and I said, well, it sounds great. Do I have time to get a toothbrush? <laughs> <laughs> but actually, uh, he knew you were so well. it was uh, a few weeks before transportation was arranged by ship 
and uh, I, a couple of others, I think there were about six men and a great many war brides, some with children returning to Europe. So we had a very pleasant trip, as you can imagine. Did he outline, did Telford Taylor outline to you what part of the case you case you might be involved in? Yes. Well, he was very interested in the fact that I had spent a number of years in Europe and was quite conversant with, you might say, both sides of the picture. Right. And I had been to almost, well, I had been to all of Western Europe with the exception of Spain and Portugal. And I had five abortive attempts to reach Spain, which was a story in itself. And then I had known a number of the countries in the East, mm -hmm. P Poland and Czechoslovakia, uh, Russia, Finland. <coughs> so uh, he was particularly interested in aggressive war camps, we discussed that, and how I would feel working on the foreign office matters, and I was fascinated by that. And I particularly uh, was keen on the aggressive war mm -hmm. aspects of it. And as it turned out, when I went to Nuremberg, I was assigned, I arrived, I think, and I'm not sure, but about July of 1946. The first trial had started in October. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, the actual first day was, I think, November 1 of 1945. And the trial was at its height when I arrived, the first trial. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was assigned to the political ministries division uh, as a prosecutor. <laughs> And uh, Dr. Robert Kempner mm -hmm. was the deputy chief of counsel in charge of the political ministries division. At that time, there was no case as such. There were a series of focal points, mm -hmm. and uh, <coughs> it was contemplated that there would be three or more major trials than actually transpired. And the reason I mention that the ministry's case, or the foreign office case, it's been called case number 11, mm -hmm. uh, represented a crunching consolidation of these three or so major elements. And it was uh, almost a painful process of selecting the defendants so mainly on the shoulders of Telford Taylor and uh, uh, people like Sprecher and Kempner and making those selections. The reason for that was that, uh, and perhaps I'm getting ahead of the story, uh, there was quite a change in public opinion mm -hmm. in American foreign policy in historical alliances, and as a consequence, uh, there was a lot of pressure to end the trials. Uh, President Truman also was not as gung-ho in his associations with <coughs> Churchill and even with Stalin. Uh, he didn't have the long-term relationships that Roosevelt did. Yeah. Consequently, uh, he faced other problems. He was very supportive, but uh, he had a lot of pressures on him. And uh, I may be getting ahead of the story on this, but uh, as it was in July of 1946, flashing back. Mm -hmm. When I arrived, I was assigned to that, and I was assigned to work in the Foreign Office case. And Kempner and I hit it off very well. 
he was a very interesting person. I can comment on that later if you wish. Sure. And he asked me principally what aspects of the case I would like to handle, and I said I would. I was interested in all the aspects, of course, mm -hmm. but the war crimes and crimes against humanity, including genocide, were fascinating, but not really uh, as challenging from a legal standpoint, an intellectual standpoint, as aggressive war crimes. And of course, also having spent so many years in Europe, I was quite keen on the uh, exploration of the actions of the Foreign Office mm -hmm. and the development of uh, aggressive war crimes. So I spent most of my career at Nuremberg on aggressive war crimes. Did you have a chance in July of 1946 and prior to the uh, verdicts in October of 1946 to interview any of the defendants? Yes, in fact I regularly attended quite a few of the sessions of the trial and I had uh, we interviewed a number of the defendants and um, I'm a little hazy now as to details, but we particularly interviewed von Ribbentrop mm -hmm. and uh, Goering, Scorzini, mm -hmm. and um, several, a number of the other defendants who were involved, one way or another, some of the military men in their role in aggressive war preparation cases like Case Groon. Now this would have been, in order, when, the time you would have had access to interview them would have been after their trial but before the verdict was rendered? Is that yes, the yes, there was a period then and uh, here again I'm a bit hazy now as to my recollection of when it was. So I you walk in the cell, I'm just curious, from a personality viewpoint, you walk into the cell, or, or however the, the, I shouldn't say the cell, but wherever the interrogation room is, and for the first time you're kind of eyeballing uh, Joachim Ribbentrop. You know, what's your reaction? You see this guy, is he, does he look like a... Can, well, What's your I, impression I, of him? I'd had some briefing on him too, and mm -hmm. I had studied his background, and I didn't hold him in high regard. <laughs> so I think this was uh, significant. He was not particularly impressive. Mm -hmm. There were very few of the defendants who were seemingly as lacking in personality as von Ribbentrop. I mean, he, he was not a dynamic figure, and uh, his he had a lot of the graces that a diplomat has, and he tr retained shreds of that. Right. Uh, Goering was by far the most dominant personality at the trial that it, when I witnessed it, and he was definitely the focal point. Mm -hmm. uh, Speer, whom Henry King knew quite well, and uh, later wrote that, recently wrote the book about him. Uh, sort of headed one camp and Goering headed another camp mm -hmm. and there were divisions within the defendants men like Schacht sort of held themselves away from uh, people like Goering and you had the impression and it's a little difficult. I've read so much on the subject matter that sometimes I have to be very careful that my personal experiences are not colored by what I've read, for example, Gilbert Diaries. And uh, you also see things that you saw in a somewhat different perspective when you uh, Only because it's a little distracting to, I'm listening here with one, <laughs> here with you with the other. Um, Did you get a chance to, to interrogate Gehring? Did, was he accessible to you? 
Not really. I was, uh, well, he was, uh, I did interrogate him with Kempner did, and right. I was in right. present at the time and observed him, and we right. talked some, and I asked him a few questions. But the primary interrogation was carried out by Kempner, who had a long personal association right. with Goering. In fact, I think Goering had ousted him from the the key ministry, I think it was of Interior, in Prussia, when uh, the Nazis took over. But well, again, you, you, you get close and personal now with a guy who on the newsreels, and you've seen him in the dock, um, is the marquee defendant, but you're now up close and personal. Which, what's the reaction? You want? I was very impressed with... Uh, Goering's uh, recognition of the fact that he was one, the leader of this group, the most prominent Nazi still alive, that he would have been the heir to uh, Hitler in Hitler's will mm -hmm. until that last abortive attempt to seek peace and then Hitler wrote him out of the will. Right. But he was the successor and he was a very attractively domineering figure. He, uh, he was sort of like a lion at bay. He gave no ground and he recognized that uh, if anyone was to hang, he was most likely. Yeah. And of course, his final gesture was one of triumph. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was surprising how the uh, German populace at that time and the newspapers were so proud of Hitler uh, I'm sorry, of Goering thwarting his conquerors and actually committing suicide rather than hanging. And uh, I remember that they had some statements on the radio and perhaps in the press that Unze Hermann, R. Hermann, does it again in sort of uh, one upmanship. Did he give any impression to Kepner uh, while you were there of how he felt the trial actually played out? Here it is. The trial is done at this point. They're just waiting for the, the verdict. Uh, did he? Did, did you get any sense of his impression? Was it was a fair trial, an unfair trial, a victor's justice? You mean Gurren? Gurren, yeah. <laughs> I don't think he ever considered the trial unfair as far as the opportunity to present his position to be well represented by counsel, uh, to have access to the media. Uh, I think a great many of them, including Gurren, considered this victor's justice. Mm -hmm. They were outraged at having uh, a Russian judge sitting on the dais above them, judging them on matters that they considered that the Russians were complicit in, right. particularly the aggression against Poland, which I thoroughly agreed with them on. <laughs> and that was one of the most delicate issues. Uh, and they took the position, Goering did a number of times, in private conversations and public declarations at the trial that the Allies, will, the Western Allies, were making a grave mistake that the real long-term enemy was Russia. Mm -hmm. And of course, in retrospect, uh, a lot of people would agree with him, certainly sure. in the 50s. And the behavior of the Russians from the time they uh, occupied the east, was eastern Germany and 
eastern countries of Europe was so outrageous and uh, uh, criminal almost that it was very uh, difficult to uh, uh, refute some of the arguments. In fact, I th always thought that the uh, argument that Russia was not a co-aggressor was uh, a sort of hollow in many ways because of their non-aggression pact which opened the door to uh, <coughs> World War II. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then when you saw what the Russians were doing in, in Germany while we were there, mm -hmm. as far as spoliation, taking industry and moving them east, and uh, using forced labor, some describe it as slave labor, right. and sending many of them east. And the many brutalities, which were exaggerated, I'm sure, but uh, had a lot of merit to them. So uh, that was one theme that Goering and all the defendants harped on and one that the judges really never faced. Okay. And they had that doctrine that we lawyers called uh, tu quoquo, That's right. where uh, it was decided that the fact that uh, the Russians had committed, say, acts of aggression, even assuming that arguendo, as lawyers were prone mm -hmm. to say, that that would not exonerate the Germans, that they were co-aggressors, co-criminals at best. And yet, uh, by the time of our trial, there were those arguments and the words of Goering and many others of the defendants in the first trial had come to fruition. And the times had changed greatly. Mm -hmm. Did, during the uh, presentation of Gehring's, uh, uh, his case, and then of course the cross-examination by Robert Jackson, which Got a lot of discussion, of course, uh, whether or not that was a complete failure by Jackson. Uh, was there any talk about that at that time in July of 1946 about, again, Gehring being the marquee, Gehring being the foremost defendant, whether or not the actual uh, cross-examination by Jackson and uh, whether that was even a topic of conversation then, or was that Oh, yes. It was it? <coughs> that was a topic of conversation. And what was the topic? I mean, what was the substance of it all? <coughs> well, I'm trying to be very careful. Oh, no, no, this don't be careful. Very, this is a very <laughs> delicate no, no, keep in, no, no, keep in mind that... Um, I thought Jackson opening statement, which I had not s seen, but of course I had read and practically memorized shortly after I was there, and his entire leadership was outstanding. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he was the inspirational leader, and I think the courts recognized that he was provide the court recognized that he was providing the vision and the real purpose of the trials and to ensure that the rule of law prevailed. Mm -hmm. Also, as a Supreme Court Justice, he carried a lot of personal prestige and uh, that having been said, mm 
there was quite a concern that Goering had far gotten the better of him. Mm -hmm. And Goering was almost contemptuous of him. And he sort of rattled Jackson to the extent that he had to resort to the court and ask them to direct the witness to, you know, answer without any exposition on his answer. Right. And I had tried enough cases, certainly uh, was still very young, but I had tried perhaps, uh, I worked in the Ministry of Mission and then Judge Advocate General or quite a few prosecutions, particularly uh, in the military. And I too was m able to notice the contrast mm -hmm. between the presentation by Jackson and the presentation, for example, by the British uh, attorneys. Yeah, Maxwell Five. Yes. Yeah. And they were professional. The British delegation was very experienced, very capable. They had a much smaller group of attorneys, as I recall it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sir Hartley Shawcross, whom I enjoyed meeting on a number of occasions, really wasn't too active. Sir Maxwell Fife really carried the burden, and he was incomparable. Right. And at, there was a great deal of consternation at the end of the first day of the cross-examination at Goering because Goering seemed to have bested Jackson. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if I remember correctly, Sir Maxwell Fife took over. Yeah, shortly, I think after the third day, that then, yeah. then he took over. And uh, sort of bringing the Southern cavalry to the rescue. That's right, that's right. And I, I think that's the impression even. But uh, I. <coughs> <coughs> I think Jackson labored under certain handicaps, having been Attorney General and having been on the Supreme Court. I'm sure his skills in the courtroom were somewhat rusty, and also, particularly as Supreme Court Justice, you wear an imperial mantle, mm -hmm. and you have attorneys and witnesses uh, <coughs> very responsive to your every wish and very courteous and uh, never assailing your person. Sure. And here he was confronted with someone who, well, all of them, who uh, he did not recognize were not ordinary defendants, these were men of great political stature mm -hmm. and great political skills and acumen. And many of them were military men and he was nine, neither of these. A and on the other hand, someone like Maxwell Fife was quite accustomed to trial work. And uh, he was supported by very able counsel who were also very experienced. Were you there for the closing statement? Were you in the courtroom? <coughs> I think I was. Yeah. I'm not sure now. And there again, it's because I had read so much on this subject that I sometimes, in these areas that I was not personally involved, half a century later, it's a little difficult to say. But I believe I was there because there's a great deal of interest and in, uh, I think I was in the audience. Were you around? For, now, were you there when the verdicts were issued uh, in October of 1940s? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what was the buzz 
uh, as the verdicts came down, uh, and there were actually three acquittals, um, did in your prosecution, prosecutor's pool, was there a, a reaction to that? No, there was no surprise. Uh, the case against uh, Fritchie was very weak. <laughs> the case against von Poppen was quite weak because he, at most, he was involved in the aggression against Austria and perhaps a little of Czechoslovakia and otherwise any advocacy for the Third Reich done as ambassador to Turkey was uh, after war really got underway and uh, mm -hmm. was minimal. And uh, shock, there was no question about him. The only reason he was inserted was because of his position and name in international circles. <coughs> there was some question as to the penalties, uh, particularly among the military men. Uh, Goering, although he was the Rice Marshal, was essentially a political figure too, but Yodel, Rader, Dernitz, Carlton Bruno, I mean uh, Kaito, there was a lot of concern that perhaps, uh, particularly Yodel's position, <laughs> uh, that they might have given him life imprisonment instead. And there was also the danger, particularly in their cases, of sort of victor's justice. <laughs> the general reaction in Nuremberg among the Germans that we were contact the general population was sort of mixed. Uh, I think many of them were more concerned with just staying alive and right. where their next meal and their next cigarette was coming from rather than the trial. <laughs> I, I think uh, the Russian behavior in East Germany and Berlin in particular uh, and, and the general hatred for the Russians uh, flavored the attitude of people, at least in Nuremberg and perhaps throughout the Western zones of Germany against the trials. And there were strong undercurrents uh, Was so that ends. I mean, basically, in October, uh, the the sentences are uh, rendered after the verdicts. Uh, in October of fifteenth or so, uh, the executions are undertaken. Uh, Gehring cheats the hangman. Uh, that phase sort of ends. The International yeah. Military Tribunal ends. Jackson leaves. Did you ever? Have, by the way, did you have any chance to actually meet him, Jackson? I met him a couple of times, <coughs> but very briefly, and yeah. uh, it was more or less just socially, so right. I really didn't have an opportunity. Uh, we were, <coughs> as the trial ended, we were swamped with work, interviews, uh, documents were pouring in and discovered. Oh, thank you. In particular, in the Foreign Office case, we were attempting to get as much as we could out of uh, the defendants and, and their witnesses, many of whom were at the uh, uh, courthouse. I can attempt. envision that there was sort of a mad dash, knowing that something, <laughs> some of these guys aren't going to be alive in a... In a exactly. And, uh, Interviews with Ribbentrop were not very profitable to us uh, because he uh, had very little to contribute and, and he was not too outgoing. And 
a lot of other members of the German Foreign Office were being interviewed at the same time and we were sort of trying to play one against the other. <laughs> but uh, there was the closure of the first trial and there was a lot of uncertainty <coughs> what happens next. <coughs> In fact, uh, as I